12 months from now, you are going to be living in the reality that you are creating today. 12 months from now, I am going to be living in the reality that I'm creating today. Today's a packed day, so we get to the office. I have to prep for my leadership meeting, which happens at 10. Uh, we have a convention prep meeting. I'm, I'm a part of the Vegas convention in July, so we got a meeting for that. You know, I don't book any meetings, official meetings, uh, until 10 a.m. Doesn't mean I'm not working before 10, it just means I don't book any official meeting. So I have a meeting with myself, and uh, that's the prep meeting. That's, you know, that's, that's setting up the day before every meeting was an hour meeting so i book an hour slot for everything uh, mentorship call one hour uh you know client appointment one hour everything was one hour now most of my meetings are 30 minute meetings now of course if i'm doing a client meeting discovery meeting that's going to be an hour meeting but most of my meetings now are 30 minute meetings so i decide is this going to be a 20 minute meeting 30 minute meeting 45 minute meeting even my hour slot meetings i usually end about 10 minutes early to give me that little buffer. I find that uh, I'm way more efficient um, when I'm keeping things short and tight. And I got, actually Ed talked to me about that. Ed, Ed told me once, he said, he's deciding if it's an eight minute meeting uh, or a 20 minute meeting. And, um, and I think that, you know, and then he had an hour slot, I think too. So cutting my meeting times down and being more efficient and getting right to it has really helped me be more productive and get more done in the day. You know, we've heard it a hundred times. How many more podcasts do we have to hear? Be strategic with your calendar. Everything goes in your calendar and do everything in your calendar. I think people are numb to it, right? They get to their office and there's like three hours of blank space and they're, they're not, they haven't done anything. They, they, they show up to work just so they can, I don't know, show up and maybe tell their spouse they're, they're busy. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know why people aren't strategic. You know, it's, I, <laughs> You talk to some business owners, they can't even get some of their teammates into the office, which is crazy. Can you imagine not going into the office every day, being an entrepreneur? Um, it's mind blowing. But, you know, again, these are the same people that have no strategy for their calendar and they're probably really excited about the weekend and they can't wait to go camping. And, and uh, you know, they wonder why at 65, 70, they don't have 100 grand saved. So. You know, it's just one of those things where success leaves clues and time is a non-renewable resource and everybody wishes at the end of the day when they, you know, on their deathbed many years from now, everybody, everybody wishes that they could get time back for the most part. Everybody, everybody wishes they could just get one more day or one more conversation for the most part. So why not live that now? Why not live, why not live in that moment today? Why not maximize your day today? And uh, I constantly think about that, right? So don't compare yourself to other people, just be you. But if you can get four, five, six, seven times more done in one day than the person in your, another person in your space, 10 years from now, you're making a million bucks and they're making a hundred grand. And that's just how it works. You got to get all the all the result driven stuff done before 12 noon that's the cutoff everything you got to you got to make your contacts book your meetings call your team he says and then from from one to five you're doing one-on-ones and that's where the reschedules come in and all right. the pivots and client calls wants to cancel so the policy your best guy calls and tries to quit he says a lot of people they leave their important shit till the afternoon and that then it never gets done because everything gets in the way in the afternoon we have lunch, our, our, like, this is where the peak state in the mornings. Then we carb load, and then afternoon, it's, we're just, it's like this, the energy drops. So, I mean, yeah, 
first seller calls it as powerless, but Ed really, really articulated it, like all the important stuff done before noon. And that's why this like work from home and get up at 11 a.m. and get into my office at 12.31, that doesn't work for those guys. Nobody's winning working from home right now. The key is if you know Vegas is coming up, it's just like if you know you're gone this weekend for three days, right? Today and tomorrow is super important, right? The people that are gone for like three, four, five days in a row without pre-planning that, they're, they're, they're crushed. They're already done, right? They're, they're bury them. They're going to be alive in, in August. So if you know you have a weekend or a day or a week coming up trap, the key is between now and then, like if I know that I'm gone for three personal days, like today, I know I, I you know, I, I got some stuff coming up that's personal. I'll put in a 16 hour day if I have to, I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll do some things that I'm so tired. I get home. I can't even, I can't even, right. I, I was the first guy at the office this morning. I locked the door, right. I'm going to be at your barbecue till 10 tonight. I'm not going home. Right? I'm going to put in a good 14 hour shift today because I have some personal stuff coming up. So we all know we're going to be gone for Vegas. We all know we have a couple days, maybe plan in July to do some personal stuff. You have to forego some personal things. You have to let go of some personal commitments between now and then you have to miss a few things. You got to go all in so that you can spend that extra time. If you're going to take extra time on the personal side this month and away to Vegas, you have to take from that pot a different pot early in the month. You have to take away here to give there. You can't just give there and, and, and run it like you've always ran it. All right, let's talk about July, okay? So our focus as a base shop, as leaders, is taking this base shop over 50 recruits. That's our, that's our goal. We're gonna take it over 50 recruits. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna empower individuals, MD level minimum, to become a 5-5-30 team because that's the only way we can make help families and impact people and, and be the, be a game changer. We talk about in our presentation, we help our, we help North Americans two ways, financial education and offering them an opportunity to get into business with us. But we all make this base shop a better place. We all contribute to it one way or another. What if we all contributed on the recruiting side? What if we all sold out to recruiting? What if we all went all in on our recruiting number and, and we didn't make any more excuses and we, we weren't pushing it off to the future and we just, we went all in. And we worked, like Trapper said, we focus on getting a result every day. Like what if we were results focused and it doesn't matter to me that your number is different than Gary's number, that's different than Trapper. What if we all built synergy in this base shop and we made it one hell of a place to be for the next six months, eight months, 12 months, as you're building and getting popped out, can you imagine what it would feel like to be promoted out of a base shop with 130, 140 licenses, how insane that would be. We all have that opportunity. Or we could continue a small recruiting culture to one or two, three per leg at MD level. We could all limp our way to SMD and then be very average and very ordinary coming out. I just want to read this quote that Eric said to Chad. I read it out of his book yesterday. He said, if my MDs can't take the time during the day to think about being accountable to me by checking in, why should I spend time thinking about them? If my MDs can't reach out to me a couple times a day and be accountable and not and think about being accountable to me, why would I ever spend time thinking about them and their goals? Yeah, I, I, I remember back to my childhood. I had a great childhood. You know, my parents worked super hard and they provided my my sister, who I have one sister. They always provided us everything that we needed. My parents were very hardworking. My dad was a bricklayer. My mom was an administrator for the company that, that my grandpa had built. Uh, but we moved around a lot, you know, because my parents were in construction. I remember living in five different homes in the first 18 years of my life. You know, my parents moved a lot. They built a lot of the homes uh, that they lived in. We moved to the West Coast for a bit for them to expand. And, and you know, a couple of things that I remember my childhood is one is always watching my parents work super hard. They're by far the hardest working people that I've ever met. You know, secondly is we, they did talk a lot about business at the kitchen table. You know, I hear people say, well, we don't talk business at the table. We talked, a, I watched my parents talk about business every single night at the table. And it really helped me uh, become passionate about business. And third is, you know, they, they taught us hard work, but they always provided my sister and I with every opportunity uh, that they could. You know, they never, it's not that they never said no, um, they weren't those kinds of parents, but you know, if it was important to us, um, they found a way to make it happen. You know, I know after after high school, 
you know, I wanted to go on this after school uh, sailing trip and I wasn't convenient for my parents to, to be able to help me go. Uh, but I, it was really important to me and they found a way, you know, my sister was in competitive dance and they always found a way to make that work. And I loved playing hockey and they always found a way to make that work. So they provided a great environment. They provided a great example and uh, a lot of great conversations around entrepreneurship. And it was good because I was sick a lot growing up too. So, um, you know, it was, it was a special time. And, you know, a lot of who I am today was because of, you know, how my parents raised me. So that's what I remember my childhood. There's one line in particular that I remember my dad telling me when I was young. And I can't remember exactly what age he told me, but I remember printing it out on a neon piece of paper and having it on my desk. And it, the, the saying was this, it says, attitude is everything. Attitude is an inner concept. And it's the most important thing that you can develop in your life. And he told me that from day one, he says, your attitude is everything, you know, stuff's going to happen. There's going to be setbacks. Life's going to hit you hard, but your attitude is number one. And I never forgot that. And I'm not here to tell you that I always have a perfect attitude that I'm the best in the world at it. But a lot of who I am, you know, when I walk into a room, I smile. My, my first instinct is to smile when I see somebody, you know, people walk around the gym with, you know, with their angry face on, like everybody's there to pick everybody else up. Uh, but I walk around with a smile on my face and because I know that, that my attitude can rub off on other people. And, uh, and I got that from my dad, you know, he, he talked about that at a young age and, um, my dad's got a great attitude and I picked that up for him for sure. I mean, my first, my first life mentor was my dad, my grandfather. I had two amazing grandfathers, you know, one, one, we called him grandpa on the farm. He had a farm in Cremona, my dad's dad. I spent a little bit less time with him day to day because he was outside the city. But, you know, all my time with him was watching him get up at 5 a.m. and go out and feed the cows and work in the shop and um, just great experiences. And again, just learning how to work super hard. You know, in my life, there's a pattern of super hardworking men. My other grandfather, who I spent a bit more time with, we called him Papa. He was local here in Calgary. We actually lived with him for a year when we were in transition between homes. And um, again, just a special man, ran a big company, had a huge vision. Those those three to me were examples, if you want to call them examples, uh, you know, mentors, yeah, but but more, more examples. Um, I learned a lot through watching. They always say leadership is caught, it's not taught. I didn't have to learn leadership from them because I watched what leadership was. Well, my first real business mentor was Ed Milet. In 2008, when I went down to LA, I got to know him and, um, you know, one day turned into a couple of days of, of mentorship. I stayed with him at his Lake Arrowhead place. And um, yeah, ever since then, it's, it's, been, it's been a great bond. You know, he checked in on me almost every day when I was in the hospital and called my wife. And, you know, our relationship is one where, you know, we don't have to speak every day. We don't have to speak every month, but um, if I need something from him, I reach out and, and he's always there. And he's definitely one of the most influential people in my life. And there's very, very few people, if any, other than my dad, um, that I would entrust with, uh, with, you know, with, with that much power and credibility all over me. And uh, yeah, he's definitely one of those guys.